have enough of these to uh, Please. We'll have to worry about filling it out right now, but uh, when, you get, when you get home and you have your family conference over here. <laughs> trees made a fine sacrifice. Yes, they did. They most certainly did. So, several years ago, when I was doing a marriage and Michigan seminars, I ran across this um, this document that talked about a family mission statement. I think we all have a statement of sorts. It may not be memorialized to this degree, but you are operating and running your family uh, under a certain rubric, and you have been for years. And so when I would meet with these couples or uh, have these seminars, I just started asking them, uh, how many of you have a, uh, a mission statement? You know, whether it be a personal mission statement, family mission statement. Those of you who are coming from uh, the business world, uh, you know about mission statements. And you know how these organizations create these things, and everybody has to be a part of it, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but I do think that there is something to be said for having a Bible-centric fabric and rubric from which your family can operate. Now, your, your family mission statement doesn't have to be anything fancy. As a matter of fact, uh, our mission statement is extremely simplistic. Our family mission statement is do what you can while you can for the glory of God. That's it. Uh, other people will be elaborate. They'll have 25 lines, and they'll talk about this, and they'll talk about that, and we do this, and we do whatever works for your family. Um, you should move in that direction. Your children should be able to state what the family mission is without without even batting an eye, without even blinking. That's how truncated you probably want to make your mission statement. But getting to that point, uh, that's where the fun is. And on uh, this sheet that uh, we're passing out to you, when you pull your family together and you answer all of these questions, and I know that there are some of you who uh, have not uh, brought children into the world yet, so it's just you and your wife and you and your husband. Uh, others of you have children. Uh, so you will want to build your mission statement differently than the person that has, um, that don't have children yet. So what I'm going to do is uh, send uh, some additional notes to Kevin along these lines and he can share those with uh, um, whomever might be interested in getting those notes. Uh, but what I want to put in front of you, and you can write uh, these scriptures on the back of your family mission statement, I want to give you uh, seven scriptures that will help you build your family mission statement. Uh, I told you from the outset uh, that um, we just need to make sure that whatever we do is immersed in the Word of God. 
It's, it's not what someone learns in college. It's not what I read in books and, and all of that. But we have to get back to the book of books. And so let me give you uh, seven uh, scriptures that uh, you can use to help build your family mission statement. Number one, uh, I want you to write God primary. And that's Matthew chapter 6 at verse 33. Uh, you know what that says, right? What, what does that say? Seek ye first. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you as well. Even though the word first is mentioned in the text, the original language means to seek primarily. That's why I'm saying God primary. Don't seek God in a list of things. It's not one, two, three, four, five. God is number one. Number two is my wife. Well, if number two is your wife and you have great-grandchildren, what are they fit in? You don't, you don't serve God from a one, two, three, four perspective. God is, period. You serve him primarily. Uh, on your paper, if you follow you, because I... Sometimes illustrations help me. You know what a bicycle wheel looks like, right? I mean, you got your little circle, and then you got the thing in the middle, and then you got all these spokes that come out from it. Well, center, central, central to everything that we do, God is in the center. And as these spokes come out, it's your wife, it's your children, it's your grandchildren, it's your job, it's your career, it's your spiritual. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a multitude of things. But at the center, at the heart of everything that we do, God has to be there. That's what that passage means. That's the sense of that passage. That's more than just saying that God is number one in my life. God is your life. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I mean, that, that, makes, a, that makes a huge difference. I'm going to tell you all a quick story. I don't believe I'm going to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It's okay. Um, I, was a, I was a young professional in Pensacola before I met my wife and uh, was teaching the young professional Bible class and there were some people that came over from um, came over from Louisiana and visited with us some young professionals and uh, one of those sisters invited me uh, to attend their Christmas party and at the time I was young single had money and I said yeah sure I'll, I'll, I'll come to your Christmas party so I you know drive to Baton Rouge and uh, we go to the Christmas party, took her back home, and she said, uh, well, aren't you going to kiss me? And I said, no. She said, why not? I said, because I, I didn't come over here with the impression of kissing you or anybody else. I came over here because you guys had a, a Christmas party, and there were young professionals that were together, so I wanted to be a part of it. She said, you think you're too good to kiss me? I said, that, that, that's not what I said. I hadn't conferred with Jesus about that. And you would have thought that she had lost her mind. She said, would you say that again? I said, no, you heard what I said. I speak English. <laughs> you know, if, if I kiss you and, and there is nothing behind the kiss, then that, that, that goes in the wrong direction. And that's not what I'm about. She said, well, I guess you confer with Jesus about everything. I said, as a So when, 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 when Jesus is primary, then all of our decisions, everything that we do is an outgrowth of that. It's how we raise our kids, because Jesus is Lord. And whether they like it or not, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, whether they, I mean, whatever they want to do is fine, but they will not be able to say that you did not love them with the love of the Lord and that you did not try to point them to the cross. That's what we want. And so I give you that passage of Scripture as the first passage of Scripture to use as you start thinking in your mind about how do we want to represent our family to the world. Here's something else I was thinking. Why did God, in his sovereignty, place your family together? Do you think God just threw you all together because he didn't have nothing better to do? He pulled y'all together for a reason. I know he pulled the Suttons together for a reason, <clears throat> to bring two outstanding preachers in the world. 
Amen. Now, did they know that was going to happen? No, they didn't know it was going to happen, but they loved God. See, when God is primary, God can do all kinds of incredible things with us. I mean, things that we never even thought about. I can't imagine what it's like to go to bed knowing you have two preachers out just tearing it up. <laughs> I mean, really? Now, I love Jake. Now, I, I was talking to Kevin, and you know, I said, man, Jake is the best preacher. He said, oh, wait a minute. We need to work on that, but Bill. I said, What's that? He said, Well, I have two sons. I don't know. So, why did God, in His sovereignty, allow you to create a family and to bring eternal souls into this world? I, I, I think that's something to think about. And so as you not only think about that, I uh, also want you to add uh, to your scripture list uh, the 37th Psalm, verses 4 and 5. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do it. So number two is his plan, not ours. Um, I was talking to uh, one of the young people there at uh, Yes Weekend a couple of years ago. Uh, just an outstanding young man. Uh, just a great kid, great attitude, great spirit. Uh, grades were just immaculate. And uh, he said, Brother Davis, you know, I, 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 I'm going to do a whole lot of things in the kingdom. I want to do this, and I want to do that, and I want to go here, and I want to go there. And I said, do you really want to do yourself a favor? He said, yeah. I said, give the blank sheet of paper to God and let him fill it out. He said, what do you mean? I said, you know exactly what I mean. What if he wants you to go somewhere that you don't want to go? What if he wants you to do something that you may not want to do? Uh, I was in Pensacola with my wife when I was uh, getting ready to finish up my Air Force career. And uh, we went by to see one of our uncles who hadn't had a shave in months. And my wife said, my husband will shave. I said, I, w I will. <laughs> I mean, she didn't, even, she, didn't even, she didn't even bat an eye. She said, yeah, my husband will do that. Because other men wouldn't do it. I was scared to death. But I shaved him. I have never been more humble in my life. To know that that man trusted me. That was the first time he laid eyes on me. I said, now, sir, you're about to experience the most incredible shave of your life. And it won't be your last. I mean, you just looked at it. Didn't even crack a smile. Thought, this is going to be tough. Okay. So when you give God the blank sheet and let him fill it out, he sends you to places like a Bearsville, Georgia to conduct this kind of session. You will never know what you have done for me and my wife. Because this eldership said, well, you know, this year, Bill, we, we're thinking about doing something different other than a gospel meeting. We want to focus in on our families. And my wife and I get to be a part of this. I, I have no words as to what that means. So I'm just saying, as we raise our children and as they look at us, they need to know that we are about making kingdom decisions. The kingdom decision is what is best to honor God. What is best to honor Jesus? And I thought about it in the middle of that traffic last evening in Atlanta. And the only reason why I didn't turn around is because I love Jake's up. <laughs> we were in purgatory last night. I know what the Bible teaches, but if anybody wants a real view, it was what I saw last night. That was unbelievable. Do any of you have to go there to, to work, commute? Nothing happens every night. I have no words 
We, we don't go unless we have to. I, I, I guess not. That's the reason we're here. <laughs> my, my wife looked at me last night and she said, we're going up here for what? <laughs> yeah, but see, that, that's what happens when you let God go out and pay. See, when you let God say, you know, you're going. Yeah, but, yeah, but that virus is out there. I know the virus is out there. But we came by faith. Amen. That's why the devil messed with my home this morning. I, I know, you know, some of y'all, you know, now you just don't know how to use a smartphone. I know what the devil does. Did y'all know if you turn left, you, you, you don't have you don't get a signal? I see one man shaking his head. I, I sure wish I had known that. I mean, I'm saying, Kevin, Kevin! You, you have to be online to talk to me. These people are going to think I'm some kind of, you know. How far would you go, bro? Uh, we must have been about two miles. <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting close to Fox. <laughs> little, little, little wide spot called Fox. <laughs> it's not the prison Fox. <laughs> <laughs> I would have stopped anybody at this point. Please point me to the Endeavor's Hill Church. I don't care who you are, just point me in that direction. So, uh, his plan not ours. That, that goes with scripture number two. That goes with Psalm 37 verses four and five. And again, uh, you know, we, we instinctively, oh yeah, I love Jesus and he's my Lord and I'll do what he says do and I'm thinking, I, oh, oh, be careful. <laughs> be careful how you fix your mouth because we don't know what he wants us to do to glorify him. Uh, number three I would submit is Keep it simple and do right by God and people. That comes from Micah chapter 6 at verse 8. You, see, you, 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 know, you know this stuff, but maybe you haven't considered looking at it from this vantage point. Uh, he has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. That's Micah chapter 6 at verse 8. So again, uh, keep it simple. Do right by God and by people. And uh, the more and more I thought about that, I thought, you know what? Our mission statement is going to be succinct and to the point. And so that's why uh, my wife said, you know, you can really be verbose from time to time, man. You need to, could we just cut this thing down just a little bit? So that's how our, uh, that's our, mission, our mission statement was developed. Number four. You want to focus on him, not them. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Uh, we have too many people who are eaten up and more concerned about what people think about us <clears throat> rather than what Jesus requires of us. Uh, I see it um, as I travel around and when the Lord's invitation is extended. People are looking out of, they're looking all around just to see, well, you know, I hope nobody moves, you know, so that we can get out of here and be the first one in line at wherever. They're not looking inwardly. They're not concerned about, you know, is God pleased with me in my current condition? And that's the way it's got to be. you got to focus on him, not them. And the closer, and, and those of you with gray hair know this, but the closer you get to Jesus and the louder you speak for him, uh, the more alienated you may, <laughs> you may find yourself. And, and that, that, that's okay, too. That's okay, too. Um, coming through the academy, uh, when I finished up with uh, Florida State uh, College of Jacksonville, those uh, evolutionary biologists, Dr. Davis, are you, are you absolutely certain that you, you actually believe that there is a God? <coughs> I said, man, why do y'all have to change your voice? <laughs> I mean, it's, 
what is that supposed to mean? Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe that Jesus is Lord. One day you're going to be admiring your PhD in hell if you don't change your ways. Have a good day. I mean, it, it, it's just amazing. They, they talk to our children and they try to chew our children up, make them feel bad, make them feel guilty. Our kids go off to college and come back home and think that they're smarter than both parents put together until they run out of money. <laughs> so they run out of money, then they find out how brilliant you are. But this stuff that they're being taught in these classes, it's a shame. <coughs> Guess I won't get on that. But um, we, we, we just need to make sure that our focus is where it should be, and that's on Jesus. Number five, uh, we need to get our mind right. Uh, and I'm going to Philippians chapter 4 at verse 8 for that one. Uh, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, lovely, uh, commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. We, we, we have to work not only on the thought life of our children, but we need to work on our own thought life. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, some people get up in the morning, and when they hit the job, somebody asks them, or make, they make the statement, good morning. Well, what's so good about it? I, I just want to take a prickly pear and just hit them right in the face. I, I know, I, 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 know I, shouldn't, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't think like that. I should do what my wife says. Good morning. She says good morning to everybody. <laughs> and they look at her like she's, she said, look, I'm not saying good morning for them. I'm saying good morning because of who I belong to. Amen. I said, well, that's good, girl, because I ain't doing what they do. <laughs> <laughs> so, good morning. Good morning. How are you? That's too serious. But she's, that's what she does. And I tried it this morning. It's pretty bad when you say good morning and nobody says it back to you and you just walk off and say, well, good morning, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> but the first time, I did it this morning for the first time in years. I, I, the guy was about to fall into the waffle iron. And he was, he was trying, I know he was trying to read what my mask said. That's, that's what he was doing. And he was just... <coughs> I thought, man, you better watch what you're doing. So I said, good morning. Hey, 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 hey. Ran back to the room. I said, Shorty, it worked. That was pretty good. Got to get your mind right, man. I mean, what you think about, that sets your whole day, your attitude. That's why the devil uh, tried to get me upset this morning. He wanted me to be late so that it would affect your attitude. Now, some of you are, 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 are A-types, I can tell. Just watching, you know, okay. <laughs> and walk. <laughs> chop, 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 let's go. Where is he? <laughs> Put him in the finest hotel in the city. You mean he's telling you can't go five minutes to here on time? What's going on? What's and, and brother, they're trying to calm their wife down, honey. He's coming. Well, where is he? Yeah. <laughs> he's here on time. What's wrong with these people? I'm, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about other people. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on from that. Uh, number six. We need to put on love. This is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So that's why I'm saying put on love. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. This is not easy. 
it's hard to love people who are acting like knuckleheads. Now, I, I know it's easy for y'all. It's not easy for me. Um, you, you, you raise your children. You, you do the best that you can. You know you poured God into them, and you, you've just gone above and beyond, and some of them get out there and act like they have lost their mind. And you try to talk to them. You try to reason with them. And then all of a sudden, you are just like a bump in the road. They no longer want to talk to you. They no longer want to honor you. And all the things that you have told them, somehow or another, has just uh, gone by the wayside. Well, <clears throat> if you don't have the love of God in your life, then you would probably do what I would do. That's beat them within an inch of their life. But that still won't, that won't do any good. That, that, that won't do any good. You have to, listen to me carefully. You have to love the hell out of some of the, some people. Did, did y'all hear what I said? Yeah. When I came from uh, Carmicell, Turkey, that was my first uh, tour of duty overseas back in uh, 19 and none of your business. <laughs> uh, okay. I came back stateside and uh, one of our church members had gone to preacher school and he invited me to Hamilton Crossroads. I think that's in Alabama. Right? Hamilton Crossroads. You ever heard, ever heard of it? Good. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he called me on the phone. He said, Bill, I want you to come over. I want you to read songs. And I said, you, you do? He said, yeah. I said, where are you? Where are you? He said, I'm in Hamilton Crossroads. Uh, I said, okay. He said, we're having a, we're having a, a luncheon or whatever. whatever. It, he didn't say lunch, but it was something like a lunch. And uh, he said, we're, we're having it uh, out on our grounds. I said, oh, oh, OK. So he gave me the directions. And I drove my brand new shiny Chevrolet Caprice through all of this red clay <laughs> dust <laughs> parked in the clearing and they had these huge pots of stew and uh, all the men, most of the men had on these white shirts with the cigarettes in the thing. <laughs> Nobody said a word to me <laughs> the whole time I was there. And I was there for over an hour. And I walked around trying to do what my wife said. Hey, how y'all doing? Now, obviously, you know, people either had hearing problems or they had hearing problems. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> said a word to me. Then Sunday morning, I go to the building and these same people are now in the Lord's house. <coughs> Nobody said a word to me. Again. And uh, so at the conclusion of the assembly, on the way out of the door, one of the uh, senior sisters, she grabbed me by the arm and she said, I, I know that you're frustrated. And I know that you're disappointed. But you have made a breakthrough in being here this weekend. She said, don't, don't expect for people to ever come up to your expectations. You do what God tells you to do. I know that this has been extremely uncomfortable. I said, ma'am, you have no idea how uncomfortable this has been for me. But I'm glad I did it because I did my work. See? So again, it's this love thing, man, it, 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 it's more than just superficial. We have people in the church who are at, at their own all points of the continuum. We have some who they will love everybody the way that Christ has loved us. Then we have other people at the end of the spectrum who are struggling. And I don't mind them struggling. I don't mind people struggling loving somebody that looks like me. I tell them in Jacksonville all the time, take me to Ruth's Chris. Spend about $400 on me and you'll get to love me. <laughs> See, we're not making investments in each other. That's why. 
When you make an investment in someone who doesn't look like you, you'll appreciate them more. But no, we, we, we'd rather stay in our own little enclaves. And, and that's why my wife and I have decided that we will never go to a congregation where everybody looks like us. That's not going to happen. That's not God's garden. God's garden is full of all kinds of flowers with all kinds of hues. And if we don't get along down here, you can forget about heaven. Amen. Now, is this easy? Again, this... This is loving like Jesus. This is not easy. People don't want to talk about this. There was a guy in Tennessee. He told me, he said, you know what? I don't like you. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> so, so, so what do you want me to change? He says, you're too loud. I said, God gave me these lungs. He said, you, you always sweat. I said, God gave me the sweat. <laughs> he said, well, you, you scare children. I said, I scare some children until they get to find out that I'm the biggest teddy bear in the room. I said, you want to know why you really don't like me? He said, why? I said, because you haven't been around somebody like me. That's why. And that's okay, too. He said, well, is there something wrong with that? I said, you have to ask Jesus about that. Because I do know that if we don't love the way Jesus expects us to love, we won't see his face in peace. That's why you need me in this congregation. That's why we need everybody. If everybody's in the church and they all think like you, I know what's going to happen to that church. It's going to crash and burn. What, what's your reaction to what I just said? You think I'm blowing smoke or you think I'm telling you the truth? It's true. It's true. Right. Amen. Amen. And these elders... Uh, who will one day stand before God and give an account for every soul that's in here. They're watching out for everybody. Everybody. That's not easy, brothers and sisters. And some of you are helping. And some of you are, you know, okay. And Jesus is watching. And so is our Heavenly Father. He's watching all of this. There was a guy. He wasn't from Adairsville, but he was from a town nearby. And he said, uh, you know, he was praying. He said, Father, I've been down to that church four times. And I go to that congregation and I walk in and I speak to people and nobody salutes me and nobody says anything to me. I don't know what's wrong with them. And God said, well, don't worry about it because I left them six years ago. <laughs> so the question is, is the candlestick burning in the Adairsville Church of Christ. <clears throat> because the thing that frightens me the most is will God remove the candlestick at Arlington? Yes, he will. And I'm telling you, that keeps me on my knees every day. I want to be a part of a church where Jesus is not there. Amen. Amen. Well, we're left to our own devices because we think we're so smart and we think that we've got it all figured out. And God says, yeah, you figure it out because I'm done with you. You better read about the seven churches of Asia Minor if you think I'm blowing smoke. Before I left Lipscomb, Brother uh, Willard Collins well, when that man spoke, it was amazing. And he said, Bill, I'm going to take you around the campus. And he did. He personally took me around the campus. And he took me into the Willard Collins Auditorium. And I think he got so caught up into what was going on. He said, you know, Brother Keeble came here and he preached and, and we had the colors up in the balcony and we had everybody and we had a great gospel meeting. And I said, Brother Collins, he said, what? I said, what color were the colors in the, in the, in the, in the, in the balcony? What color were they? And it, 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 just, it just shocked him. He said, what? You know what? I said, what color were they? You said they were colored? He said, well, you know. I said, no, I don't know. I want you to tell me. Why would you have people in the balcony roped off by chains to hear the word of God? Amen. 
Walk with people walking up and down the aisle to keep people separated. What was that all about? That man broke down in front of me and said, we have a lot to answer to God for, don't we? I said, yes, sir, we do. But my respect and admiration for you just went through the roof. See, he needed that walk with me. And I needed that walk with him. What are we going to do? Run from each other? We can, where are you going to go? I'm going to go to another church. Well, what church would that be? If it belongs to Jesus, it is the church of Christ. Period. Amen. There is no other church. Amen. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? That's why we need each other. Amen. See, y'all are sitting here thinking, man, you know, yeah, this has been pretty good. We're, we're really glad you're here. <laughs> but, but you don't know what this is doing for me. Better and pretty good, right? So when you put on love, and you put on love like Jesus loves, that draws the world. And that draws people to say, man, you got something, and I don't know what it is you have, but I want it. Whatever it is, I want it! Because they can see it. Okay, and then here's the, here's the last scripture. Uh, this comes from Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 2, and that is, be worth imitating. Whew. You know what 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, where, where Paul says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ? That gives me pause, brothers and sisters. It, it, it really does, because, you know, I, I want people to imitate certain aspects of my ministry. Not to imitate my ministry. But when you are on the altar and you're up front and above board and you know that you show yourself once and all, what are you going to do? Um, when I served as a dean, uh, these mothers would come in, and I'm, I'm telling you now, they didn't have to be big. They just had to be a mother. Fathers, I could deal with. But mothers, they would come through my office door and they were going to get me to change their son or daughter's grade from F to something. They hadn't been in class the whole semester, but they were going to get me to change their grade. Those are mothers. They'll fight for their kid even when they know their kid is messed up. Fathers, yeah, he didn't come to class? Nope. Well, we'll pay the fee. Honey, let's go. Not mothers. They're not going without a fight. So when they came through the door, I just, I did just like this. When they came through the door. Well, then they just, they just, they did just like you did. They just, what are you doing that for? I said, ma'am, I surrender. <laughs> Turning myself into you early. So whatever you have in your pocketbook, <laughs> be it handgun, saw, or combination, I'm turning myself in to you. And I lay myself at your mercy. And at the end of every conversation, they left and said, they deserved the, the grade that they got. And I said, yes, ma'am, they did, and I'm glad you said it. And yes, I'm afraid of you. <laughs> That's what mothers do. I, that, that's why I respect them so much. I was that. What was I going to argue with her for? That would not have proved anything. But for them to see that I was willing to surrender, they were impressed. Some of them even sent me gift cards through the mail. <laughs> never met a dean like you, and I thought, I know you, and you never will, <laughs> because I serve Jesus. And if you don't think Jesus didn't come up in those conversations. You don't know me very well. That is a wonderful time to talk about Jesus. I'm talking about their child, and I'm talking about their development, and I'm talking, I mean, it, I couldn't help it that Jesus was just brought into the conversation. <clears throat> My boss came over and said, hey, uh, I heard that you're talking about God in these meetings. And, you know, that's against state statute, and you can't do that. And I said, I'm going to do that have been doing it, and will continue to do it. Because you're talking about leadership, I know no better leader than Jesus. 
not lab suit, or any of the rest of them. So what are you going to do? Sir, you, you just make it real difficult for me. Baby. So I said, I know. I know. But y'all are going to miss me when I'm gone. And they do. People still call me. Man, you know, you were really, you really used to rock. I said, yeah, right. I know. But you have to do what you can while you can, right? Yeah. But uh, this last verse, be worth imitating. Our children need to look at your family. And they need to decide in their heart of hearts. Man, that's the kind of family I want. That's how I want my wife to be. That's how I want to be. I mean, I, I want to drive the Silverado. I want to drive the Ford F-150 with the Duelist. I mean, I want, I want all of that because they belong to God and because they trust God. That's why they have what they have. I want that for me and my family. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm glad y'all have the boats, and I'm glad y'all have the property. I thank God you have it. How many of y'all are raising your own vegetables? Anybody? What, what congregation was that we went to in Georgia where I almost ate myself to death because of, I can't, where was that? Uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't there. I can't remember what that was, but I'm telling you, everything on that table had been homegrown. I told my wife, I said, girl, even Publix doesn't have vegetables like these. I mean, it it was it was just I mean I don't I don't have words. I'm telling you I ate myself into oblivion. But y'all eat like that all the time and the air is just crisp and so clean. And y'all just walk around like, well, what are you talking about? I mean, this is, this is all we have to breathe. You know? Yeah, I know. You come to Jacksonville, you know, about 60 miles out, you're going, yep, we're getting close. <laughs> so, as God continues to bless you and our children can see how men and women of God, men and women of faith, who trust in God and God has blessed them, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's what it's all about. Amen. But to be worth imitating, we got to have our sights set where it should be. And we have to go into this thing as a family, all pulling from the same end of the rope. And so I just wanted to put these verses in front of you. Uh, as you look uh, on the other side of that sheet, you can kind of work through some of the things there. But um, I, I think, again, in the final analysis, you already have something that you are doing. It's just a matter of putting pen to paper and say that uh, this family exists too, and then just list it out. And this is how we're going to do this. <clears throat> just list it out. And then you, you got it. I mean, for the most part. And again, that's why I wanted ours to be as, as, as uh, short and as succinct as it could be. So when my wife said, you know, and, and why, why, are we, why, are we going, why are we going up here again? Do what you can while you can. Yeah, right. Go so, well, <laughs> and it's over. And uh, so that, that, that works. Uh, any questions you have about what we have uh, chit chatted about? God's word is awesome, isn't it? Amen. 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 Woo! Man, that Bible is oh, wow. so wonderful. Uh, so much, um, so much uh, spiritual prime rib in there that uh, can just make a difference in how we live and how we think and how we behave. And uh, so, I just wanted to make sure that I use these moments. Uh, while you are enjoying your physical food, uh, to chit chat about something that I think is crucial in developing a Christ centered family that's on their way to heaven. Amen. God be the glory. Brother Bill, we got one more session, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you would, get your trash right here.